I spend a lot of my time trying to parse out the who's deciding, product owner, product manager, sitting over here, sitting over there, they hit me first um, <laughs> thing, right? And, and often it's sitting with the development team who tells me the product managers don't show up enough. And then I get to sit with the product managers who explain that they're supposed to be out talking to customers half the time. And so this is a, a sort of decomposition. Uh, the takeaway, of course, is that titles don't matter, but building product and shipping product really does matter, and there's stuff you have to do. So we're going to dive in and see where we end up. Okay, so here's my agenda. Um, I'm going to claim that there's a difference between product owners and product managers, and I'm going to try to define it for us. Even though titles don't matter, it's handy if you've got a label for the one and the other. And maybe you can agree on what you're talking about. The second one is I'm going to walk us through a couple or three failure modes. Um, there are more failure modes. There's an infinite number of them. But let's look at the two or three that are ones that I run into all the time. And hopefully they will look familiar. Well, maybe not. Maybe we hope they're not familiar. And then I've got some organizational maps because a lot of this is about who sits where and how they cooperate. And I'll try to draw some pictures. And then there's a cool animation in the end if we get there. All right. Is that OK with everybody? And it should be interactive. So jump in with questions. We'll have a quiz slide coming up, I think. Do we have a quiz slide coming up? Um, and we'll give away some books now. I don't have any more with me because I didn't know we were doing this. But we'll, f we'll collect cards and we'll send books. OK, so um, here's, here's the setup. And the setup is if you go into any recruiting system, you know, Indeed.com or um, you know, the LinkedIn jobs page, you'll actually find lots and lots of jobs that are labeled product manager. You'll find very, very few jobs that are labeled product owner. In fact, most people don't go into the market and hire product owners. They simply find them where they can and they put them to work, right? So product manager is a job title that HR understands. Product owner is a set of work you've got to do or it's somebody has to do. Uh, I'm going to try to paint them as starkly as I can because they overlap, but they're not the same thing. And particularly for large projects and particularly for commercial software, the one person per team and then we're done honestly doesn't work for me. So we'll try to mold that into something else. Um, but the most important thing over and over again for me is it doesn't really matter what you call anybody. If we're getting the work done and we're shipping stuff and we're being successful and the customers are happy, then we're doing it mostly right. And if the others are the case and we're not happy, then it doesn't matter what title you have. We've got to rearrange and fix stuff, right? It's all about the outcomes. It's not about the outputs. OK, so um, I don't know if anybody's a dog lover can tell me what kind of dog that is. Shepherd. Australian Shepherd. And what do Australian Shepherds do? Herd. They herd. Um, if you live in a city and have an Australian Shepherd that doesn't have a job to do, anybody done this? <laughs> That's right. They start by chewing through all your furniture and then whatever else is left, right? If you're an Australian Shepherd, the thing you do is you herd. And if you've got nothing to herd, you find something to herd anyway. Product managers are naturally herding animals, right? <laughs> and we're going to find something to product manage whether we have it or not, right? Um, <laughs> um, if, you, if you ask what a product manager does, right, how do we know? We've checked the pulse. And the first thing, if you're a product manager, particularly, again, for a revenue software company, you think not about just the bits, because the bits are important, but you think about the whole product. And the whole product includes lots of other things besides the bits because your customers don't pay you for the bits. Your customers pay you for joy and success and outcomes, right? And so what are all the pieces that have to go into the product to make it work? The other thing you spend all your time thinking about is trying to avoid getting hypnotized by one customer because if you're building software for one customer, we have a different, word, different phrase for that. What do we call that? We call it custom software or contract software or contract development. What we don't call it is the software business, OK? Because um, the goal of being in the software business is that you, it's a fixed price to build it for the first customer. But everybody else, you can run an extra copy off for essentially zero, right? And so all the money is in the second, third, fourth, fifth, 20th, thousandth, 500 millionth customer. Uh, and if you're hypnotized by one customer or one user, then not so good. OK, so um, here's the quiz part. All right, this is designed, this is actually a chart I designed for engineers. Anybody an engineer, former engineer? I go to the meetings, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and here's how it works. So if I put product management in the middle, notice I don't put product management at the top. 
because nobody works for product management. <laughs> but I put it in the middle because that's our focus. And the, and the first part of this is what's the inputs, what's the stuff that flows from product management to development? Come on. Sorry? Requirements. Requirements. Good. What else? Intent. Vision. Vision. Intent. What else? Risk. Risk. Sure. Timelines. Timelines. Stories. Epics. Stuff. Right? So I have a list here. And it's incomplete, right? Here's all the kinds of stuff that might be flowing from the product managers to the development team on the faint hope that we're going to somehow see the same future. And these are partial attempts to describe what we think we want. They're partly wrong. They're partly incomplete, right? Um, if the development team really wants to misinterpret them on purpose, <laughs> there's really nothing I can do, right? Anybody, what was the movie, Bedazzled? Anybody remembers this movie, right? Anyway, doesn't matter. This is, this is my faint attempt to try to paint a picture of what this stuff should be. All right? Not so hard. It's still easy so far. What's the stuff that comes back? What do we get back out of the development process? Sorry? Increments, yeah. Nobody cares about increments, sorry. We get software. We don't get product. We get software, OK? I'm going to call them product bits. Because it's not product. It's product bits. Why is it not product? So let's ask the question, what do marketing and sales of, of our company want from us? Revenue. Yeah, well then, a sellable product. Yeah, but more specifically, when they're banging on the heads of the product managers, what are they asking for? Finished product. Finished product? Yeah, no, they don't want to ask. Actually, they don't care about that, right? They just. Um, user experience. User experience, sure. Anybody? Sellable product, which mostly includes what? What the customer wants. Yeah. Anybody sold anything in this room? No. Okay. What's the first thing you want to engage your customer <laughs> with when you're trying to sell them something? What are their values? Yeah. What do they really need? Yeah. So there's a list of things, and I include, for instance, segmentation. Who is this for? Right? Uh, messages. What do we say about it? Why should they care? Right? Um, uh, if you're in marketing, you know that your budget, your mental budget for any product is three bullets with no more than eight words each, okay? Because <laughs> that's how much you can put above the fold and at the top of the data sheet. So messages, features, and benefits, but mostly benefits. Customers don't really care about features, right? Pricing, it would be really good if you don't let your sales team decide how to price each deal. Can't recommend that, right? Qualifications, demos, here's a bunch of stuff without which we can't sell anything, right? Right? Now notice, there's no item on your right that is a one-to-one -one match with anything that's on your left. Okay? Hmm. So the only reason those things are related is because in somebody's brain, we've translated one to the other, or some group of people saying, well, if those are the things it does, here's what we say about it, <laughs> right? On, on a good day, right? So, so the sales and marketing team actually is not at all interested in the details of the bits. They're interested in the thing we're going to tell customers that causes them to open their checkbooks or write purchase orders or whatever it is, right? OK. Uh, what do we get back? Anybody who's dealt with sales and marketing people, what do we get back? Yeah, um, not usually, but OK, good. Anybody? Feedback. Feedback, that's right. And feedback's a key word for? Good and bad. No, it's mostly, right? It's feedback. <laughs> um, uh, if, I sur if, if I surveyed your sales force, for anybody who's got a sales force, and I asked them these two questions, well, these questions, what's the number one reason we closed big deals this quarter? And what are the two reasons we didn't close big deals this quarter? What's, anybody know what's the number one reason we closed big deals this quarter? It's the same at every company. What is it? That's exactly right. So come to me later. I have a book for you, right? So this is true. It's provably true. Go to your sales force and ask. The reason we closed big deals this quarter is because we are great salespeople. We're well above average. In fact, all salespeople are above average, OK? Um, that's really important. OK, what are the two reasons we didn't close deals this quarter? Yeah, the products are poor and? Weak salespeople. <laughs> no, there are no weak salespeople, right? So the product was missing a bunch of features and? Too expensive. 
Too expensive, that's exactly right. So you get the other book, right? So if you survey your sales team about your products, you will be shocked to learn that they're great salespeople and that you should lower your price and add hundreds more features, okay? That is what you will learn if you talk to your salespeople. I guarantee it, okay? Which means that there's another line to draw here that's the most critical line on this chart. If you wear the product hat or the UX hat, and you don't talk directly to people who use your product, who try your product, who pay for your product, who rejected your product, who bought something else. You don't know anything. And the specs or the requirements you write are suspect or worthless, right? And the stuff that you put into data sheets is questionable at best, right? If you sit in the product chair and you don't deal with real live customers out there in the field, all you have is what the sales and marketing people told you, which if you remember was, lower the price, add more features, and I want to go to club in Hawaii this year and get the big bonus, right? Um, by the way, that's why salespeople make twice or three times what product managers make, because <laughs> they do. Okay, so really important, if I'm not talking directly with customers in the market, I don't know anything, and I don't have the right to draft requirements. Okay, there's a third group for any company that has executives, who's at a company with executives? Okay, what's the input from the product management function to the executive team? Status, Status yeah, sorry? Progress, Progress yeah. Budget, Budget updates, closer, right? So everything that goes up to the executive team, and it's usually in the form of forecasts and strategy and there's almost always an ask in here, mm -hmm. right? What am I asking for? What am I asking for? Money, money for, money for what? To build that product that costs too much. So what is it that I spend my money on? My teams. My teams, my development teams, right? So, so as a product manager, I spend a fair amount of my time pitching the executive team on why I need more and better teams, right? Um, uh, we're on dogs here. Okay, anybody tell me what a dog whistle is? Anybody know what a dog whistle is? That's right. Right, it's a tone that only dogs see. There's a reverse dog whistle process here, which is any sentence that comes out of your mouth that goes toward an executive that is not denominated in future money per unit time can't be heard. Okay? <laughs> right? Everything you say that doesn't include the phrase, will bring us revenue in the next four quarters, or will lose us market share in the next two quarters, won't be heard, okay? As a general rule, there are some executive exceptions here, but mostly this is about pitching future revenue, future uncertain revenue, in return for a request for more development resources, right? Okay, what do we get back? What comes back out of that conversation? Sorry? More, oh yeah, but from the executive conversation, we either we get one of two answers. Yes or no. Yes or no, right? And if it's no, sorry. Yeah, depends on your company, right? So some companies have a 15 gate process too. But okay, so we're gonna get a yes or no. If it's a yes, we're gonna get some budgets, some staff, some targets. The budget is for development, and the staff is for development, and the target. What's the target? Yeah. Uh, by the way, it's the same number you pitched on this side, but it's two quarters earlier. Okay? <laughs> so the reason to draw this, this complicated chart is that if you sit in the uncomfortable place and this is, oops, that's not it. Let's try this. No. Nope. We're going to go back. Okay. Um, if you sit in this uncomfortable, weird product management chair, you actually have to be trilingual. Okay? You have to speak enough developer that they don't lock you in the closet and disinvite you from the stand-ups. Okay? Yes? Okay. You have to speak enough customer that you know what they're talking about when they ask for things in their own language, in their own setting, in their own context. And you have to speak enough future finance that your group doesn't get shut down. Right? Because you're always in the position of promising future revenue in return for the current development staff. Go. Okay. So I believe that that person is a purple unit. Yes, I agree. Well, I, I, they do exist, but they're rare. Okay. So, okay. so if that be the case, should we not be speaking in terms of uh, two people, three people? Yes. Different disciplines, 
Absolutely. So, so that was, in fact, the point I was going to make, which is there is no person on the planet who's born with those three skills. Right? Um, it's a rare combination to get somebody who can do all three. Right? Um, we're going to have to, and this is going to lead us directly to where we're going. Uh, when I'm hiring for this job, and I think we actually have the hiring slide coming up, what, what the, and, and it has a picture of a unicorn, so you get the last book. Okay. Uh, we'll come back to the unicorn in a sec because it's essential to the discussion. Okay. Does this make sense? This is the ideal, this is the platonic product, product manager. Okay, let's keep going. So other things that are important about product management, and I think I made the point this morning, this is not a purely rational run the spreadsheet, uh, ROI based, um, uh, rational decision process. It's partly that, right? But everybody at the table has an agenda. You guys know what HIPPO stands for? Health insurance, privacy protection. Yeah, not so much. That's HIPPO with two A's. Oh. Okay. <laughs> HIPPO stands for the highest paid person's opinion. Okay? <laughs> right? If you're at the table and you don't have a lot of facts, the person who's going to get to decide what the decision is is either the salesperson or the executive or whoever makes the most money. Okay? So, um, and, and the other point here, um, at, again in, in the software world, but I think it's generally true, um, we pay sales reps. How do we pay sales reps? Anybody know? Commission. commission, right? And what do you get commission on? What you sell. What you sell, right? What you, you eat, what you kill, right? And you don't get commission on the whole, what the whole company sells. You only get commission on the deals you close. So we pay them to be, you know, smart and persuasive and to figure out who at the customer's side will say yes and when they say no to escalate and to find some other friends and to work the system on the customer side until they can get someone who says yes, right? And then we're shocked, shocked, when I as the product manager say, no, you can't have that feature that Goldman Sachs wants, when they turn around and apply those same skills to my organization, and they go over my head, and they lobby with executives, and they up the size of the deal, right? Sales reps are not paid on the goodness of the overall corporation. They're paid to close deals, raw meat. That's why we hire them. That's why they make twice what I make, right? And I love them because otherwise I'd be out of a job. However, we need to know that it's not a pure spreadsheet around the table, my deal's bigger than your deal, so we're funding my deal. Not how it works, right? Um, so the product managers traditionally have a lot of responsibility without authority, and part of what we have to do is keep the wheels turning, right? We'll come back to the unicorn in a sec, because that's important. In fact, there it is, okay? There's the unicorn. Um, I, I had somebody on my team go out and pull job descriptions, job postings for technology product manager jobs in the US. So that was mostly software companies that were trying to hire product managers. And here's what they all wanted, right? So um, almost all of them wanted somebody who'd been a product manager for three or more years, right? This is going to cause a problem in a sec, right? I don't know where they come from. Um, everybody wanted excellent communication skills because if you can't sell and communicate internally, you can't do this job. Um, everybody wanted a college degree. Almost everybody wanted a CS degree. In fact, Almost all of them wanted it from MIT. <laughs> Limited supply, okay? A lot of them wanted MBAs, which is good, but not required. And then almost everybody wanted expertise in their very narrow area. So if you were building three-factor authentication, you wanted somebody who was a product manager and met all those other qualifications, and also had six to 10 years of expertise on three-factor authentication. Not just security, not just network stuff, but, right? I, and there's only two companies in the space and the other one doesn't have a good product manager or he's happy and he's staying there, right? So we're in the unicorn problem exactly right because in fact these folks are hard to find. They're hard to keep if you treat them badly. Well, they'll stay for a while. Um, and they're hard to grow. And if we come back to the skills issue, um, I'm almost always recruiting out of the technical side because it's really, really, really hard to come in late on the technical job skills. but it's all the soft skills and the communication skills and the customer stuff and the customer appreciation and empathy that you have to have or you're just another ex-engineer writing specs without talking to customers, right? Which is a failure mode we're gonna see in a sec, right? So, so we've set ourselves up for a job that's hard to do, unfortunately. Um, I guess I should say, um, Really, really smart product management folks do product management for five or six years and then they move up into some other executive role. I've been doing product management for 25 years. You can figure out what that means. Okay. All right. So here. Um, we've all seen this chart. We know this chart, right? What's the very first thing we do? 
No. What's the very first thing we do? Vision. Vision, which I call charter. Okay? Charter vision. Before we assign developers and teams to work on something, it would be nice to know what it is or who it's for, right? Then, then and only then, duh. And, and you say that, but almost every day I get a call from a team. I, I, in fact, I, I won't use their name because they have a building within sight of here. But I was, um, I was here working with a company and they had spent, I don't know, 12 or $15 million and 50 engineers over two years building an architecture for a marketplace but they hadn't figured out who the customers were or what the problem was. <gasps> and, and when you picked up the, the little curtain and you said, well, who's got a product something at the front of their title? A lot of quiet, okay? And the answer was they didn't have anything that worked and they didn't understand their customers and we, we put that project down. Okay, anyway. We then build a product backlog, which is all the hopes and dreams for all time for this product or project, right? Which is, turns out to be too big. So we do some release planning, and then we do a release backlog, which is all the hopes and dreams for this release, which doesn't fit in a sprint. So we do some sprint planning, and right? We're gonna step through the thing here, right? This is, this is your generic out of the box scrummy thing, right? Sorry? Good question. Good question. So, so I was going to take the failure mode first, and I'm going to circle this thing right here and say if we haven't figured out what success looks like and we haven't figured out what problem we're solving and why fo folks are either going to pay us for it or give us their attention and we don't understand what we're doing, most of the failures I see are at this moment here, which by the way means that your developers can't dig you out of it, mm -hmm. right? They can be as fast and as good as, as you can hire them, but you can't dig your way out. Okay, let's keep going. So we're going to come back to that. All right, so that was the product manager story. Let's take apart product owner, and let's go right to the scrum books because Jeff's going to be talking in an hour, right? He wrote the book. <laughs> Here's what all the books say. Go to scrum.org, and I highlighted a couple of words in bold italic there, right? And these are the words that give me great heartburn. Okay, so why does the customer give me great heartburn? Well, it's representing it, not actually saying Okay, the customer. Why am I having heartburn? Because well, there's more than one. Because there's more than one, that's right. Every scrum book you pick up will talk about the customer, one customer. And what they're assuming is that you're in an IT structure where there's somebody else who approved the budget and you're going to bring the report or the thing to them and they're going to like it. And by definition, it's okay because they liked it. Right? And in the software business where you're going to have lots and lots of customers who want different things, you can't just ask the first one. Right? And in fact, you're going to have to make hard choices because many of the folks won't be in your target segment or won't want the same thing and you can't build the, something for everybody. What's my heartburn about at any time? Anybody? It's what every single scrum book says about every product owner. Indeed. So if we just spent 20 minutes talking about how important it is to understand a breadth of customers and their needs, but the book says I have to staple my product owner to a chair and she's not allowed out of the building because at any moment the team could come to her with a question, right? We've set up a problem for ourselves, haven't we? Okay? And, the, and every single book tells us that you must be 24 by 7 available and not miss a stand up and those two days out talking with customers, problematic. Okay, let's keep going, right? Um, on the other hand, by the way, this is exactly what development teams want. They want somebody who sits with them all the time and unblocks them in a moment's notice and is never gone and is never questioned, right? That's actually what they want. And in fact, I'm gonna talk about something I call the hungry, agile beast. Because in the old waterfall days when development was sort of slow and lousy, um, it was easier to keep up in the product job because they weren't getting much done. Now, there's this big engine, right? We gotta feed it. So we're gonna go with transportation analogies. All right, this is, um, anybody remember steam trains? There's, there's somebody with a shovel in front of the mountain of coal here. Anybody know what this job is called? Stoker. Stoker, there's another name for it, yes. Fireman, fireman that's right. That both of those are good. I went with firemen. So the fireman is the person who holds the shovel and moves coal from the pile of coal into the engine. Why? Because you've got to feed the beast or it's not going to go. That's right. If you stop shoveling coal, the engine stops, right? 
So here we are. The steam engine fireman needs to constantly shovel, shovel coal, otherwise the train will stop. Right? Is this completely obvious? This is the product owner job. Okay? You're not allowed out of the building because at any moment the engine could stop. Right? Um, good. Okay. Again, I'll send the slides around. So when I draw this same chart, remember this chart? And I do it for the, I'm going to call it the small p product owner because I'm taking the very narrowest view out of the book, not the chief product owner thing. Here's what I get. I get inputs, I get product bits, and I get to meet with the two showcase customers, right, who come in every two weeks for my demo, right, who are completely representative of my marketplace, right? Wrong. <laughs> okay. They are the two customers who love us the most in the entire world and they're willing to show up every two weeks. And they forgive us all kinds of things as long as we give them increasingly complicated features for their special needs. Right? And they're exactly not who uh, our random, out of the box, can install it newbie customers are. Okay, so if we do this, what we're doing is we're becoming custom software vendors with two customers. Niche. Okay, go. Niche. niche, yes. Or niche, depending on where you're from. Okay, let's keep going. All right, so. This niche. Niche, yeah. <laughs> Indeed. I'm a foreigner here, you know, from San Francisco, they made me bring a passport. Go ahead. So uh, uh, let me draw the bubbles because it's problematic no matter how we draw it. Okay, where are we? All right, remember this chart? When I draw the product owner work, it's almost all within the sprint boundaries. Okay, this is really time across here. So, of course, I'm involved in release planning, but almost every product owner, by the way, is assigned after we form the team and decide to do the work, right? Which means, yes, yes, they are. Remember we said all the failures were over here? You didn't assign a product owner until after you've already committed the project and the budget, okay? So if, in fact, most of the failure modes are here, our product owners are, well, it's an uncomfortable place to be, right? Now, the product manager job, as it's traditionally defined, is the outer loop and not the inner loop, right? We're going to set ourselves right up for your question, right? Notice that the intersection, the, the union of these actually fills, fills the problem, but one or the other, we're going to have some really awkward moments, right? So let's, let's dive in. All right. Um, I'll also claim, by the way, that those of us old enough to remember what levers are, okay, um, that the product owner's job is narrowly defined. If you, again, look in the book, it says, well, what order we're delivering it and is it technically sufficient, right? The product manager's job, because the product manager worries about outcome, not just output, if you aren't in charge of pricing and competition and lining up partners and evangelism and all this other stuff, maybe nobody buys your thing, right? Now, the problem is the product manager job is too big, right? And product owner job is a damn hard job to do. We've just tripled it and we said, well, have a nice day, right? So let's look at some failure modes, right? Um, the first failure mode I call absenteeism, right? We're back on trains here, right? Go to your team and see if there's anybody whose job it is to be a product anything, right? Didn't show up. Right? Forgot to have one, shared across seven teams. Um, the engineering folks are going to write their own stories. Right? Um, right? We borrowed somebody who's never done the product owner job because they know something about our market. Right? This is the absolute fundamental failure mode because what you've done is you've let loose the train, but you haven't figured out where the tracks are. Right? So, Worst possible choice is we forgot this product thing. Anybody handy? How hard could it be, right? Okay, let's keep going. Uh, the next choice is, is we had a product management team. It was kind of scrappy and understaffed, but then we went agile and we simply said, right? Were you there? Yes. Right. We simply said, look, the product managers now also have to do all the stuff that's in this book that says product owner, but you're not allowed to not do any of the things you used to do as a product manager, right? Okay, so what we get, what we get here is, um, yeah, most product management teams were already understaffed because it's hard to explain and nobody understands what we do, right? Um, we added, I figure, about 60% more work when we got the teams agile and we said you've got to be there for every sprint planning session and every demo and every, right? every ritual, uh, and you're allowed out of the building, 
right? Um, we added 60% more work, and then we told you just to man up, or whatever they say in Texas, right? Um, so, so, so for me, I, I'm thinking of the classic scrum team, which is probably seven to nine people with mixed set of skills. And one of those might be a tech writer, and some of them are writing tests, although we don't call them testers anymore because we don't assign that that way, right? I'm thinking of a team in the eight to 10 cents, right? Um, and I've personally done the whole job where I've done all the outbound product management and all the customer management with a product that sits with one team, right? Which means my ratio was one to 10-ish. Right? And I will claim that a good seasoned product manager can do the whole product manager job and the whole product owner job if your product is sufficiently small that it sits with one team and you don't need much sleep and whatever and your marriage is already on the rocks, right? <laughs> um, but what I see routinely is I see ratios like one to 30, right? And we, we took a product management team that was understaffed by half and then we just made it a little more exciting, <laughs> right? So this failure mode is where your product managers are all trying to do all those things and they're simply failing. And mostly what they do is they revert to being product owners because that's where all the love comes from and they forget about the market, right? Okay, so that's the product manager failure. We haven't solved it yet. So the product, oh, here we go. You guys know this show, right? Um, <laughs> when, when I survey development organizations about how they want to pick product owners. Back to the skill set. What is it that, they, that the folks who are picking product owners are looking for? They're breathing. Product knowledge. Sorry? Product. product knowledge. They want subject matter experts. What else? They want someone to remove all complexity and ambiguity from their world for all time. Sure. And <laughs> I want to meet that person, right? Um, but they want subject matter expertise, and they want somebody who can write stories. Yeah. Communicate. Communicate. And honestly, they want somebody who knows enough about coding that they can deeply bond with the team. Over and over again, what I hear is, we want somebody who knows enough about code that we don't have to teach them anything, right? Good choice, bad choice. That's what people are asking for, right? Not in your case. Okay, I'll buy that. Well, I'm just shaking my head. Just to make well, so. We're going to fix it. We're going to try to fix it. But first, we have to identify what it is, right? When I go to uh, organizations where the product owners are all part of the development shop, being picked and hired and groomed and selected by development managers, they're junior, they're subject matter experts, they know something about coding, and they can write stories. OK, they so don't know anything about business. of course they don't, because we didn't ask them to, right? So internal borrowing is a lot, right? Um, they're SMEs, they got some technical chops, and maybe they already know the market because you got technical, you got product expertise. What they don't know is what they don't know about the market. It's whatever their opinion is, because that's why you picked them, and right? They don't know the customers. And they don't know the customers, okay? Um, what they don't have, and a big thing that we do in the product management world is we keep people from helping, right? Everybody with a good idea that wants to bust into engineering and stop the sprint, right? There's a lot of holding back. And the product owners tend not to be selected for the ability to hold back senior people and divert them and keep them occupied over here, over here, while the sprint's going on so we can put it in the backlog, right? And the other thing is that um, they tend not to have any marketing skills and they tend to believe, as all engineering folks believe, in a rational marketplace <laughs> where customers choose our product based on reviewing the specs. <laughs> okay, I'd love to live there. Okay, as we saw, most of what happens in the selling world is not just about the specs, right? And they also have a bias toward the smartest users, right? By the way, um, a good marketing strategy for your product is not just to select for the really smart users, because <laughs> on average you're missing most of them, right? You have to appreciate how hard it is for the average person to pick up your thing, right? If you're working at uh, Orbitz or Expedia or whatever it is, you got to have a lot of newbies who can get tickets bought or you're out of business. So again, the bias here is for a lot of really good stuff, but it leaves a hole. Okay, so, so the failure modes, right? So the product manager failure mode is when I, as a product manager, I'm a part-timer, right? I don't show up, the backlog's old, the stories are crappy, I've got good intentions. Have you guys ever used this phrase? <laughs> Uh, I don't actually know what it's supposed to do, but you guys are smart, right? Question for you. Sure. Um, 
One of the things that I heard when I came to my current company was that the product manager is the CEO yeah, so of the product. I, I hear that a lot. <laughs> so, so my test for that is, can I fire my development team? Okay, because if I were this, sorry? Of course never, of course never, right? So the CEO has a really hard job. I was CEO very, very briefly once and it almost killed me and I have great respect for people who can do it. But the CEO has a span of control to say, if something's broken, I can fix it. The product manager has influence. The product manager has no authority, right? So you can work really hard to make the team better and happier, but you can't replace it. So the CEO, not so much. Okay, we gotta keep moving. So build what I meant, and I think there's a picture here. Okay, so we're in transportation, right? So <laughs> this is the, tr the train off the tracks, right? Um, I didn't, I didn't good, do a good job. So let's take the other side. Let's take the product owner failure mode. And who can tell me why there's a plane here? Yeah, it's missing, why is it a plane? Yeah, it's, I, I can see it's crashed. Why is it a plane? <laughs> It's because Agile is much, much faster than Waterfall. And on the old model, all we got was a train wreck. But planes are much faster, OK? <laughs> there we go. OK, so here's, here's the product owner failure mode as I've set us up, right? Which is somebody who doesn't really understand how marketplaces and customers work and is making good choices but not the best choices because you're thinking about a rational world where none of that stuff happens. Uh, you don't know your marketing and your sales counterparts. You're not networked with them. Right? And you believe that the two showcase customers that you're meeting represent somehow the market. Right? Not a good outcome. So there's the plane. Right? Um, do we have something else here? Okay, the last one. Right? So here's, every, this is lack of direction in case you missed it. <laughs> right? Um, we don't have a product person. We don't have a market direction. We let the teams build whatever they want. And this is, this is the, the hopeless case we talked about this morning, which is a beautiful, perfect, high quality, easily usable product that nobody needs, nobody wants, there's no customer for, and we don't get paid for, right? Not so good. This is when there's nobody in the product seat, right? Okay, so we set up a really bad situation. Let's see if we can repair it. Um, so I'm gonna draw some maps, all right? And here's how the maps work. More technical to your left, more market focus to your right, more managerial up. And if you were at a startup, and I've spent a lot of time at startups, uh, let's say you're at a 25 person startup and there's therefore 12 people in engineering, right? The answer is you got one person to do all this stuff, have a nice day, right? And so we have the heroic single product everything. And I use heroic in the original Greek sense for those of you who study literature. How do those heroes stories always end? Badly, right? But it's a tough job, it's a great job, we love it. And you do the whole thing, right? So this is be product owner, be product manager, be product strategy, do pricing, do customer stuff, right? You have to cover the beach because it's all you got, right? And we, in Silicon Valley, we all hope to be at the startup that you're gonna read about next year so we can retire. I hope to be working, well, never mind. Okay, so this, the, this is the place we all start. The, the place we hope not to end up is this picture. Oh God. Where there's product, <laughs> notice there's product owners on one side, there's product managers on the other side, and the white space in between is the most important thing here, which is they don't talk to each other, space. They don't call each other, they sit in different buildings or cities, um, they don't respect each other, there's a lot of finger pointing here. And what we end up with here is we end up with building stuff and hoping for something else. <laughs> Right? Not the best picture. So we've got to find some way to put these back together again in a place where we have a larger team. If we have three teams, if we have seven teams, what do we do? Because one heroic person can't do this for three or seven teams, right? So here's a few other pictures. Sorry? Sure, we make a team. And, and the way I draw the team is I say, there's probably somebody a little to this side who's really more of a product strategist and manager and mentor and maybe a director, right? Who's gonna keep this stuff holding together. And if you've got a bunch of small products, if you can break it up into small products, then you can have a series of people who do the whole job, but you've gotta have some framework, otherwise you end up with disconnected products that don't share a strategy, right? If you've got bigger products, sometimes you might draw a picture like this and you say, we need three people on product X, 
let's say it's, maybe it's more than three teams, maybe it's five teams, okay? And we've got two folks who are pretty senior smart and they can play product owner with two teams each, maybe. And we've got somebody who's gonna spend time outside, but the overlap is all about how they're gonna sit together, they're gonna join on the same phone calls, they're gonna have lunch together, because that's how we reduce barriers, right? They're going to, um, when this person's bringing back notes from a customer meeting, they're all gonna share them. When these folks are busy prioritizing, they're all gonna share them. This has gotta be a group pod. As soon as we send them to their respective corners and have them not talk to each other, bad things happen, right? And there's an infinite number of ways you can patch this up depending on how big it is, but you've got to have the mix of skills, right? So now I can say, well, here's somebody on this side who's more MBA-ish and maybe a little less hard on the product details, but really knows sales and marketing in our space, right? By the way, I, the way I usually say it is, it's okay to have an MBA, but you don't want to be an MBA. <laughs> I have an MBA. Uh, okay, but, but notice that we're, we're gonna try to piece together our unicorn problem here because we're gonna get a few different people with different skill sets, right? And we're gonna put them together in a pod and we're gonna try to build some cohesion. We're gonna do some Vulcan mind melds, whatever we do, to get those folks thinking as one because this is all about delegation and this is all about um, shared point of view. As soon as you've got a product owner who's prioritizing based on just what's on the spreadsheet, um, yeah, I don't want to be there. Go. Interaction model in this scenario only include them interacting with the product owner? No. Or would you want them to interact with as a pod? So, I, I, I suspect that what we do here is that each of the two product owners spends a lot of time with one or two teams, and the product manager better spend some time with those teams. So, if I'm thinking about the stand ups, product owner, I'm thinking about the end of sprint demo and the retrospective. I really want my product manager there as often as possible, 80% of the time, right? So if you're gonna plan trips, well we know they're in two week slices, plan the trips in the middle so you can be there for sprint planning, right? Because we wanna be making good decisions as a group and as soon as the product manager says, I've delegated and I want nothing to do with it because I'm in the business, right? And you're on the technology side, we're back to that really ugly chart, right? I know I'm selling to the crowd here. Uh, all right, I have one set of little animations to go and then we'll take a couple of questions. We okay? Good, all right, so here's, here's the exercise. I have a big product and it has eight teams and this is how everybody would draw the standard canonical not thinking very much about it chart, okay? Every team has a scrum master, every team has a product owner and somewhere there's some product manager who's supposed to have vision, right? Let's, let's break it up and, and let's ask a different set of questions to figure out how we're gonna pick product owners and what they're supposed to do, right? So my first question is, well, are all these teams doing the same thing? I bet they're not, right? So let's figure out, uh, what does the team do? There's a team that's doing what I would call headline features. So that's the stuff that's gonna appear on the data sheet, it's gonna be in the press announcement, it's got a lot of user-facing, UX stuff, right? Um, that's what, we're, what the sales reps are gonna talk about when the sales call happens, right? But here's another team that's working on performance re-architecture, right? And there's a one-liner that says, runs 40% faster, but honestly nobody on the outside cares why it runs 40% faster, right? And we got a team that's doing UX, UI focused stuff here, and we got a team, for whatever reason, we got a bunch of data connectors here, or network connectors, a bunch of ins and outs to partners, okay? So our product's complicated and we've divided the teams by expertise. So now let's ask the question, who should we want to be the product owners for the different pieces of this? Okay, we, we with me? All right, so um, I'm gonna put a lead product manager up there because somebody needs honestly to be driving, right? Um, but let's start, I think, with the performance re-architecture, okay? So who's the best person to be the product owner for the performance re-architecture? Or gal, or gal. But it's probably somebody who's a performance architect, right? Yes, exactly right, a performance architect, maybe two, I don't know, right? Because 
as a product manager who's tried to write the stories below the epic that says, run a whole hell of a lot faster, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, they're looking to me to decide which things should be refactored and, <laughs> right? The, the person who's most qualified to do that is probably a performance architect, right? Okay, let's take the other side. How about on the headliner features? I'm gonna, oh, I'm sorry, we're on UX. I'm out of order here. So we might have a UX person who is leading playing product owner for the UX team makes perfect sense. Or we now have a product owner with lots of design sense. Your choice. Okay, how about over here? I'm probably gonna put somebody who's really a product manager at heart on the headline features because those are the ones we're gonna be splashing all over the press stuff and we have to interface with marketing on, right? And down here for the connectors, anybody got an idea? The API person, I actually picked some kind of technical marketing engineer. I don't know, right? You go through your organization and you say, who is the right person to do this? Now notice I picked four different kinds of people, right? And it's all in blue because it's okay, right? So now let's take the logical shift and we'll change color to red and I'm gonna move these people around, okay? And the first thing, oh, by the way, they should all sit together, they should all talk together, they should deeply entwine each other in all these pieces, otherwise we end up with crap, right? That's a crud is what I was gonna go for. Okay, good. Technical term, right. So, but let's move these folks around. Let's, let's move the product manager from the headline stuff over to the performance architecture. How are we feeling? Edgy. Edgy, okay, yes. Let's move the performance architect over to be in charge of drivers and connectors, right? I hear the resume hitting the street, okay? Let's take our technical marketing engineer and put her in charge of the UX, okay? Yeah. Now, we might be okay with the UX person doing over here, but mostly what I've set us up for is we took the same people and we rotated them one position around, and we got a really, 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 really bad result, okay? The point of the exercise is I didn't say product owners should always be the following people with the following expertise, right? That's a failed model in my view, my humble opinion. What you want to say is, this team needs performance architects, and this team needs UX, and that team needs frontline folks who talk with customers about features, right? That's the way you get stuff done. And if we take a cookie cutter approach, what we end up with is a random assortment of people who are failing for a random set of reasons, right? Um, and it's not good. All right, let's wrap. Um, so, so here's my thought, delegating to product owners, because in my mind, if we have a product owner and a product manager, the product manager is in charge of getting the right result. And so I am delegating to the product owner and hoping like hell, right? So varies with scope, right? What's this team working on? I should have a picture of a cookie cutter here. I don't think I do, right? You gotta have full-time product owners. It's a lie, it's a failure when you say, we're just gonna borrow 10% from someplace else. Doesn't work, doesn't end up in good product, don't do it, right? Um, either a strong dial or a solid line to the product management group, we want them sitting together, we want them sharing. If we put them at opposite ends and we don't let them talk, bad things happen. Um, and the product managers are still responsible if bad things happen, right? It's not engineering's fault, they built the wrong thing. We okay? So I think there's a wrap up slide here. So here's my takeaways, right? You gotta staff these jobs. This would seem obvious. Every place I go, I have this argument, right? No, we need more developers because they actually do work. Not so much, okay. Um, not a sideline, not, not an afterthought. On the large projects, it's not obvious that product managers have to fill all those jobs. You should be thoughtful about it, right? Um, it would also be handy if we hired and trained people on purpose. Mostly in the product owner jobs, we borrow them from someplace else. We give them no training. We send them back when we're done. It's not a career. It's a stopping off point, right? You were something else. We used to call you a business analyst, whatever. We're gonna give you this title, but only for a little while, and then we're gonna send you off somewhere else. Um, if it feels like a stopping off point, it's because it's a stopping off point and you're not getting good value and you, Right, you're not treating those folks well. And, and the cookie cutter assignments, I think, lead to really bad outcomes. So, that's me, that's me. Let, we got two minutes for questions or I'll hang out. Thanks for listening to the tirade. <laughs> I'll put the slides up, anybody? Come on. I know everybody in the room didn't agree with me on all of this, so somebody must have a hard question.
can you talk to uh, uh, relationships between your product owner and analysts? Yeah. So, so on the teams I work with, so revenue software companies don't have business analysts. IT organizations have business analysts, and I think you have to find some division of labor here. But I think the product owner has to be the person who's deciding, which t to me tells me that the business analyst is either more junior or, or somehow lower in the hierarchy, maybe. Um, I love those folks, they do great work. I don't, know how to f I don't know how to piece it together except on a case-by-case -case basis. Anybody else? Okay. Jeff Sutherland. Yeah. Go forth. <laughs> Go forth.